Hi, and welcome to the Becoming Trauma-Informed podcast, where we help you understand how your past painful experiences are affecting your current reality and how you can shift those so you can create your desired future. I'm Dr. Lee, and both myself and our team at the Institute for Trauma and Psychological Safety are excited to support you on your journey. We talk about all the things on this podcast. No topic gets left uncovered. So extending a content warning to you before we get started, if you notice yourself getting activated while listening, invitation to take care of yourself and to pause, skip ahead a bit, or just check out another episode. Let's dive in. Hi, everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome. So excited to have you here listening today to this podcast episode. So this is a triple threat and I've been doing this and it's kind of fun to do these together. I'm like seeing how many places I can focus at once, I guess. So I am recording this. It is going to go up onto our podcast, Becoming Trauma Informed. It is live in our Facebook group, Becoming Trauma Informed. If y'all are in our free Facebook group. And then I'm also streaming this on TikTok. So I'm the multitasking queen today. So if you're listening to the podcast, if you have any questions or any comments, you can head to the show notes and send us a note there. If you're watching on the Facebook live, you can leave some comments there and I can answer those for you. And then if you're on TikTok live at the end, I'll come back and answer questions for you. So this is kind of a big day for me because what I'm going to be sharing with y'all is actually something that I really came up with, that I created from all of the research, all of the studying, all of the thousands of people that I have interacted with at this point as the CEO of the Institute for Trauma and Psychological Safety. And this whole thing that I'm about to teach you, these six chronic dysregulation patterns, these six patterns of chronic dysregulation, is something that came to me in one day. So a little backstory on this, we were preparing for our trauma-informed parent course. And I sat down with my husband and I was like, okay, I want to make up a quiz that helps people understand how they show up towards parenting. And so I sat down at the dining room table and like, I, I kid you not, like six, seven hours later, this is what came out of this. And originally I had developed this just around parenting. And then when I was thinking about it, I was like, this isn't just around parenting. This is something that shows up in every area of life, every area of life. And so for those of you who have never maybe listened to a live, or this is the first podcast you're um, catching, or this is the first time you've seen me on TikTok as a trauma coach, One of the things that we talk about a lot is our acute dysregulation, what it looks like when we get acutely triggered, when our nervous system goes, something's wrong, right? Something's the matter. Something's threatening, whether that's physical or psychological. And we spend a lot of time talking about our acute threat responses, our acute trauma responses. So we have fight where we go into, I'm bigger and stronger, and I'm going to try to overpower you or beat you up. We have flight where it's like, I'm going to, I'm faster than you. So I'm going to run away from this thing that feels scary. We have fawning, which is where you're like, oh, I'm going to people please and like make you really happy so that you stop threatening me. And then I feel better and you feel better. And then we have freeze, which is like, I'm going to play dead, right? Those are acute trauma responses. Those are things that happen in the moment. What I have found uh, as like an amalgamation of all of this research, as a synthesis of all of this, is that there are actually six patterns of chronic dysregulation that we see. And these patterns of chronic dysregulation are basically how we take these moments, right? How we take these moments of acute threat, of acute, something's wrong, of acute, oh my gosh, I'm going to lose love, safety, or belonging, or, oh, this person is making a, a mean, or giving me a mean look, or this person maybe isn't accepting me. Like, these moments, these individual moments of the potential loss of love, safety, and belonging. And we start to string together chronic responses to threat. And these chronic responses are due to the fact that we are seeing needs not be met. And what I mean by that is As humans, we have three core needs. And these are three core needs that I've identified. Like, you're not going to find this in a textbook. I have to write the textbook first. (laughs) I keep joking with my husband that this is going to be my PhD project. And then that's also 
requires me going back to school. And I don't know if I'm ready for that, but there are three core needs that we have. We have the need to feel safe, right? To feel like the space that we are in is safe, meaning that we can, our lives are not going to be threatened. Our lives are not going to be threatened, either physically or psychologically. We have the need to feel in control. We have the need to feel empowered. We have a need to feel like we have capability. We are, we are capable of choosing what happens in our lives. And then we have the need to be liked, to be appreciated, to be valued, to feel like our being here matters. So we have this need to be safe. We have this need to fit in, to feel liked, to, to be a part of a community, to feel valued. And we have this need to feel empowered, like we can make our own decisions and our own choices. And so these six patterns of chronic dysregulation all arise, emerge when one of these three needs is not met. And so each of these needs has two patterns of chronic dysregulation that I've identified that accompany them when they're not met. And so we're going to start with the need for control, the need to be in control, in power, to feel like you have the ability to control what happens in your lives, in your life. So the first pattern of chronic dysregulation is what I refer to as the emotional presentation. And the emotional pattern of chronic dysregulation is where you try to control what's happening outside of you in order to have inner calm. So what that means is, is that your, in, your locus of control is actually outside of yourself. So in order for you to feel good in your body, in order for you to feel in control, in order for you to feel calm, everything around you has to be emotionally calm. And notice what I said there, emotionally calm. So if anyone does anything that causes you to feel emotionally dysregulated, they need to change what they're doing. So people who have this pattern of emotional dysregulation, and by the way, I will say this too, I want to add this in before I go any further, is you can have multiple patterns. You can have different patterns in different situations. So you might have one of these patterns show up in your personal life and one of these patterns show up in your professional life. With the emotional pattern, you know somebody who is chronically dysregulated and, and who shows up in this pattern, they are emotional. A lot of times they get labeled as over emotional, which I don't think is a thing. I, I don't agree that you can be over emotional. You can just have a lot of emotion or you can have not a lot of emotion. So people who have this emotional pattern and notice the language I'm using here. I'm not saying people who are emotional are, are emotional emotional people. I'm saying people who have this pattern because it's a pattern. It's not a character trait. It's not their personality. It's what they've developed in order to survive. It's what they've developed in order to feel regulated in the world, to deal with all the chronic threat. So the emotional pattern, they get very, very easily dysregulated. And when you see that dysregulation, it comes out as emotion. So these are people who explode. These are people who externalize how they are feeling. And when you listen to them talk, they'll say things like, you made me feel this way, right? This made me feel this way because this is outside of their control. Everyone else needs to be in control for me to feel in control. So some examples of emotionality in this emotional pattern in parenting, which I think is such a great place to take it. And you, you can recognize if you had a parent who had this emotional pattern is People around people who have this emotional pattern walk on eggshells. People have to walk on eggshells around you. They have to control what they say. They have to control what they do to try to avoid you getting upset. And I'm going to be so vulnerable and transparent with y'all. This is my dominant pattern or was my dominant pattern, I should say, before I started working on it. 
combined with another pattern that I'll tell you about in a minute. So when I felt like I needed other people to help me feel regulated, I needed other people to help me feel calm. It was other people's job to fix how I was feeling. So people who have this emotional pattern also don't often have great boundaries. Spoiler alert, none of these patterns have great boundaries. So primary focus is feeling internal control of your thoughts and feelings. These people are ran by their feelings. They withdraw intimacy when others do not do what they desire. People who have this emotional pattern are often labeled as intense or very sensitive. So highly sensitive people might also have this pattern of emotional dysregulation. They expect other people to soothe them. People with emotional pattern of chronic dysregulation often feel like they are the victim or the one wronged when conflict arises. And people who have this emotional pattern will often violate other people's boundaries to get what they want, especially when they are triggered. The other thing we see with people who have this pattern of emotional dysregulation is they will have dysregulated attachment with other people. They'll be very hot and cold with other people. If you are doing things that make them feel good, they will be very connected. If you are doing things that make them not feel good, they will be very disconnected. And the last piece of this is from a self-absorbed perspective, like they're focused on how other people make them feel, okay? So the goal of somebody who has this presentation of chronic dysregulation is to do the work to feel safe feeling your own feelings and to feel safe letting other people feel their feelings too. People with this pattern feel unsafe having big feelings and they feel unsafe when other people have big feelings too. So feelings are unsafe. Feelings take us out of control. So my goal is to get back to that internal control state. Anyone identify with this emotional pattern? Right? Anyone? I know I do. <laughs> so a lot of the work that I had to do was like, okay, it is safe for me to have my own feelings. It is safe for me to have my own feelings. It is safe for my husband to have his feelings. It's safe, it's safe for my kids to have their feelings. And when they have their feelings, I don't need to get bigger and have bigger feelings in order to get them to then manage me. And so this has been so huge as a parent because now what I can do for my kiddos is when they have big feelings, I can actually hold those. I can hold space for them to have big feelings because I'm not getting dysregulated when they get dysregulated. And this is something that we teach in our foundational certificate program is like really how to do this. And we're going to be touching on it in our trauma-informed coach program. So if this is something where you're like, oh, I really need to learn this, then definitely come in there. So the second type is also about control, but this person's going to look much different. So if the person who has the, is presenting in the emotional pattern is like, like out of control, they look out of control. This other pattern looks in control. So this is the controlling pattern of dysregulation, chronic. So the controlling pattern is I'm going to control the external environment and not from a place of like, I need other people to fix me. It's I need to fix the outside environment. So the focus is different, right? The focus goes from, I need everyone else to focus on, to stop feeling what they're feeling and focus on what I'm feeling to, I'm going to not focus on what I'm feeling and focus on everything outside of me and make sure that that's all in line, in order, just right. So People who have the controlling pattern of chronic dysregulation are almost always in a leadership role. They're almost always in control in group settings. And their focus is on doing things, quote unquote, right. Their focus is on doing things right. Now, this is the other pattern that I exhibit. So you can see the unmet met need for me in childhood was control, okay? And I grew up with a parent who was more controlling and a parent who was more emotional. So 
that makes a lot of sense that then I developed those patterns because if my parents felt like they needed to be in control, that meant that as the child, I wasn't in control. So now I develop these needs to be in control. Okay. People who have this controlling pattern will appear very rigid and inflexible in their decision-making, and they will not consider other people's opinions or desires. It's my way is the highway. It's this is how things are done. This is how we do things, right? A lot of people who are raised in military families have experienced a controlling parent. A lot of people who are raised in like religious families or as my friend calls them PKs, like preacher kids they've experienced this or developed this because what they have to do things right. They have to do things in line with how other people expect them to do them. The thing of it is, is that if we are raised by a parent who has this controlling pattern, or if we are a human who has this controlling pattern, people who have controlling pattern withdraw intimacy. They withdraw love, safety, and belonging from other people when they do not do what is expected when they break the rules. So if I am a control, if I have a controlling pattern and somebody breaks a rule, I am going to be like, well, you can't be in my space. I no longer accept you. You're getting kicked out. You're getting shunned. You're getting rejected because I need you to follow the rules because I need to be in control because that's how I handle my stress. That's how I handle my dysregulation. So people who have a controlling pattern are also often referred to as people who are domineering or perfectionistic or type A. They will oftentimes choose to work solo on projects. They'll have difficulty collaborating with other people where it's like other people get to have ideas and feelings and thoughts. They will take over other people's work to ensure that it gets done to their standards. And then they will get frustrated that other people didn't pull, quote unquote, pull their own weight. And just like the emotional pattern, the controlling pattern, people who exhibit this will violate other people's boundaries to get what they want. They don't care about your feelings. They don't care about your feelings and they don't care about if it hurts you because they are doing what is right. And so your your safety, your love, your belonging isn't as important as their needing to be right. Some examples just in the the parenting again is kids are oftentimes just expected to know how to do things without being shown steps or directions when they have a parent who's controlling. If any of you have ever experienced this, it's like, okay, I'm eight. I should, you know, you should know how to do your laundry by now, but like, have I ever actually been shown how to do my laundry? A lot of times those of us who, who grow up in households with a parent who has this controlling pattern, mess and noise is not tolerated. You're just expected to fall in line. If you're in a relationship with somebody who's in a controlling pattern, this is going to look like there is a power differential, meaning that they uh, have more say in what happens. So this can look like a boss employee relationship or a general soldier relationship. Like a lot of times you'll see this as if the controlling pattern is with a more patriarchal family dynamic where it's not, okay, dad leads and guides and ensures that everyone is taken care of. It's dad's in charge. Dad says what goes. Everybody does what dad says he needs to do or says we need to do. And like, there's no arguing. There's no if, ands, or buts. That's just how it is. And oftentimes kids who are raised by parents who have this controlling pattern, they feel like they're bad. They feel like they're wrong. They feel like they can't live up to their parents' standards. This was a huge wake up call for me as a parent. Cause I still can remember the first time one of my kiddos said, like, I feel like I can't live up to your standards. And I was like, Oh goodness. Okay. All right. <laughs> that was a knife to the heart. And also thank you for telling me that because I'm recognizing that we don't want our kids to grow up in a house that feels like a dictatorship. We want our kids to grow up in a house that does feel like a democracy to a point, right? A democratic republic, as my husband would probably say. (laughs) The other thing I will say, and I I meant to say this about the emotional pattern, is kids of parents with emotional patterns will show up one of two ways. They'll either be very stoic or like super hyper vigilant with other people. Like they're going to watch you. 
They're going to watch you. They're going to make sure that you're not getting emotional because if you're starting to get emotional, then that's scary. And so they're going to like try to fix it, right? Or they'll be super stoic because they're not allowed to show emotion in their own house. The other way that they'll present is that they will get really emotional too, because when they are outside of that parent's home where they're not able to be, be emotional and they're with an adult or friends or people who do allow them to be emotional, they'll be really emotional because it's almost this overcorrection. So we have the emotional presentation and the controlling presentation. And both of these are, what are we trying to control? But the emotional is trying to control their internal environment. The controlling is trying to control their external environment. So you can kind of see how you could flip back and forth between these. You could flip back and forth between these because you could be in maybe in safer spaces, like in your own home, you're going to be more emotional. And then out in the day-to-day -day world, you're going to be more controlling. That's how I was before I started doing work to un undo a lot of this chronic dysregulation. So we're going to move into the next piece, which is the superior and the pleasing presentations. Now, these two presentations are based off of feeling valued feeling important, feeling seen and heard and contributory, feeling like it matters that I exist, okay? That is what these this unmet need is, is I don't feel like I get validated for just being me. So I am going to show up in two very distinct ways in order to get that validation. And the first way, the superior presentation is I'm going to focus on feeling successful and special and appreciated by others for my talent and my hard work. So sometimes people look at the superior and the controlling patterns and they confuse these two because the controlling pattern is very focused on what's right and what's good and all of those things. And the superior pattern People are really focused in on having very high standards and expectations for themselves and others. So you can see like there's some overlap there. The superior person though doesn't care about being in control. The, the person with the superior pattern cares about you liking them and thinking they're special. So my unrealistic high standards and expectations for myself are all about getting validation from other people. I have a really hard time if I have a superior pattern coping with failure. Because if I fail, it means that nobody's going to validate me. It means I'm not going to be important. It means I'm not going to be seen. It means I'm not going to be valued. People who present in a superior pattern prefer tasks where they can feel important, special, and integral to their success. So you can see where the superior person, or excuse me, I don't want to characterize them. The person with the superior pattern would maybe take over as group leader because they want to be seen as the leader because the leader gets the most attention. The leader works the hardest. The leader is the most important. Whereas the controlling person is like, I don't care if y'all think I'm important or not. I need to make sure this gets done right. The superior pattern will also like the emotional pattern and like the controlling pattern withdraw intimacy when others don't respond the way they desire. So if I work really hard, and you don't pay attention or validate me, and you don't care, like I'm gonna go find somebody who does. The superior pattern is people who exhibit this are often also labeled as perfectionists and high achievers. And for them, it's about the spotlight, not about being right. They are also very self-absorbed as evidenced in the emotional pattern. They are focused on how others see them how do you see me? How do you see me? How do you see me? And just like the emotional pattern and just like the controlling pattern, they will often violate other people's boundaries to get what they want. So you get what they want. Because if I, I might, I could cheat. I could lie. I could steal because I need to be in first place. I need to have the gold medal. I need to win because if I don't win, then I fail. You know, for me, I really love movies. I'm a huge movie and TV fan. If you ever work with me, I will constantly quote movies and TV. And so I really like to think of, if you think of the emotional pattern, if anyone's ever seen my big fat Greek wedding, the dad, Gus, he's emotional. 
it's which is interesting because I think a lot of people would look at him and call him the more controlling parent and there is some controlling pattern there and it's mostly like he needs everyone to do what he needs them to do so that he feels good about what's happening. A controlling pattern is, oh gosh, I'm trying to think of a good one. What's a good one? I'm thinking of that movie Election with Reese Witherspoon. If anyone remembers how rigid she was, although that might be superior too. But thinking of like a movie with a cult leader, a religious leader, right? They have to be right. Superior, I just think of one of my favorite movies, Pitch Perfect the main one of the main characters she talks about how her dad says basically when or perish (laughs) like the only like if you're not gonna win then don't come home so when we think about this from a parenting perspective right if you have a parent who's presenting as superior you have a or you as the parent are having a superior presentation you're gonna enroll your kids in specific activities so that they can excel People with superior uh, patterns also often live vicariously through their kids. They will relive their glory days through their kids, or they will have their kids participate in the things that they never got to do and live vicariously through them. Parents with a superior presentation will also oftentimes take the spotlight from their kids during special events. You ever seen a pageant mom that forces their daughter to enter into pageants even though their daughter doesn't want to and then when they win like they take all the credit anyone ever seen that or um I I know that there used to be shows like pageant moms and dance moms that's one of those things another one of my favorite movies is drop dead gorgeous which is so not trauma-informed and politically incorrect and so I'm just acknowledging that it's it's also a funny movie and Kirstie Alley in that is a perfect example of a superior parent with her daughter So the goals for somebody who has a superior presentation are to practice doing things for fun, not just to be good at them, to create safety and not striving and driving all the time, and to focus on internal regulation around allowing your kids to feel special, allowing your kids to feel special. And here's the thing, y'all, is just reading through some of the comments that are coming through here on the lives is, Some people are like, well, I like to feel special. Yes, this is a need for everyone. It is a need to feel like you're appreciated and you matter and you are contributory. Like that is a a, a legitimate need that we all have. And when as children or as young adults, that need is not met, it starts to outshine any other need. And so we start focusing on subconsciously and we create these patterns around this chronic dysregulation of like this need doesn't get met so how can I make sure it gets met and we start doing things that aren't helpful or that hurt other people that harm other people like our kids or like our loved ones or like our colleagues or like our employees or our clients so if you have a client showing up if you're a coach or a teacher mentor guide whatever and you have a client that's like I have to be first I have to win. It's do or die. It's first place or no place. Like, you know, that you're dealing with somebody who has chronic dysregulation in this superior pattern. If you have somebody who shows up and is like, I have to do things right. And when I mess up, it's not okay. And not from a place of like, people aren't going to appreciate me, but from a place of like, I'm bad if I mess up, then, you know, you have somebody who's dealing with a controlling pattern. If you have someone that's like, I am emotionally all over the place all the time and feel like I cannot regulate myself and I need everyone else to be okay for me to be okay. That's an emotional pattern. So you can start to see these in your clients and know like, okay, if these are patterns that show up for my clients in specific places or just generally, because some of us will have these patterns in just one specific place. Some of us will have them all over. It's really helpful to then like know how to coach them because you know what they need. You know what their unmet need is. Their unmet need is to feel in control or to feel validated, to feel appreciated. And so you can start to create some ways that are like aligned and, and that don't violate other people's boundaries in order to help them get those needs met. So we're on to the next part of the chronic dysregulation patterns, which is, or the fourth one, which is pleasing, the pleasing pattern. 
So the pleasing pattern is like the superior pattern where their primary focus is to be liked. Like they want people to appreciate them. They want people to think that they're amazing and they want to be liked in a way where people describe them as nice and likable and friendly and kind and easygoing. They want people to think that they are really great friends and really great supporters and just like so nice. So superior people want to feel exceptional. They want to feel appreciated for their talent and hard work. People who have the pleasing pattern, they just want you to like them. And they will do pretty much anything in order for you to like them, including violate their own boundaries. Hey, friends. Hi, TikTok friends. So people who have this pleasing pattern are highly sensitive about other people's opinions about themselves. Highly sensitive about other people's opinions about themselves. This pleasing pattern is the classic people pleaser that we see, right? The, these, this pattern people have difficulty saying no to others. They're often codependent, meaning that their feelings depend on what other people are feeling. So kind of like that emotional pattern, right? With the emotional pattern, I can't be okay unless you're okay, but I'm, but so I need you to be okay. It's very similar to this, except the pleasing person doesn't want you to be okay so that they feel fine. The pleasing person will do whatever they need to, to make you feel fine because they want you to like them. So a lot of times the person who has this pleasing pattern will deny their own needs in the pursuit of meeting other people's needs. They will deny their own needs in the pursuit of meeting other people's needs. My needs do not matter as much as yours do. So that's the difference. The emotional person says my needs matter more than yours do. The person in the pleasing pattern says, no, 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 your needs come first. People who have a pleasing pattern will get very triggered, very upset when they inconvenience or upset others. And they will let other people violate their boundaries to maintain the persona of being agreeable or nice. I'm going to say that one again. People who have a pleasing pattern will let other people violate their boundaries or they won't even create boundaries to maintain a persona of being agreeable or nice. People who have this pleasing pattern also like to avoid conflict. They will be the middlemen in arguments trying to get everyone back to getting along. So people who have a parent who have this pattern, or if you are the parent who has this pattern, the kiddos of people with this pattern are usually very unruly or rowdy. They'll have little structure or discipline. So they're the kids that are just like running amok. And when you're like, hey, are you gonna like tell your kid not to bite that kid or do this? They're like, oh no, they're fine, right? Parents in a pleasing pattern have usually very few rules or expectations of their kids and they let them do what they want. And so these kids have the opposite reaction that a lot of kids of people with emotional patterned parents do. So these kiddos oftentimes will throw temper tantrums or misbehave when other people don't let them get their way. So they're so used to not having boundaries that when somebody sets boundaries, they like don't know what to do with that versus the stoicism and the hypervigilance that we often see in the emotional patterned kiddo or the kiddos that are have parents who have that emotional pattern. The parents who have this pleasing pattern oftentimes volunteer to help out and they do a lot for their kids. And the other thing we see is that people who have a pleasing pattern as their dominant pattern are often partnered with a person who has a more rigid or controlling parenting style. So one of the things that happens If we have a parent who is more pleasing and one of these other forms of chronic dysregulation, the last one that we'll talk about, which is passive, if they have a pleasing or a passive parent that is partnered with a parent who is more rigid or controlling, this child may feel unprotected by the pleasing and or passive parent. If the pleasing or passive parent basically bows down to the rigid or controlling parent and says, yes, like I will do whatever you need to in order to be happy and feel good. And that controlling parent or that rigid parent is not nice to the child and that pleasing or passive parent just says, yep, that's fine. That kid can really struggle. 
really struggle because they will feel unprotected by the parent who just let the controlling or the rigid parent do whatever they did. This is why people can have very different relationships with anyone who parents them because they're going to have different experiences with each person who's parenting them because each person who parents them is going to have a different pattern of dysregulation. So the goal for somebody who is a, has a pleasing pattern is to practice regulation around not being liked and to learn to set boundaries for yourself and others. And this is huge. I have clients who show up in pleasing patterns and they'll walk, they'll like vacillate between the pleasing pa um, pattern and one of these other patterns. It's like more rigid or controlling. And it's just back, forth, back, forth. And basically what they're doing is they're chronically going into fight mode and then chronically going into fawn mode. So they're in fight mode until somebody gets really upset with them. And then they go into fawning mode and they're like, how do I fix this? How do I help you? Uh, we had a question. Can you help your clients with this, even if they're not aware of how they present? Absolutely. I don't typically teach my clients about this. I don't typically tell my clients like, hey, you're in an emotional pattern or you're in a superior pattern. This is something relatively new that we're bringing to the Institute too. We've only taught this once in another setting or twice in other settings. So as we start to talk about it more and more, this might be something that I start to like bring into one-on-one -on -one work and your clients don't need the labels. They don't need to be aware that this is their pattern for you to help them see like, hey, do you notice how when other people get emotional that you have a really hard time dealing with that? Or do you notice that when other people get upset, like you're jumping through hoops to try to make them feel better, even when you're like hurting yourself, right? And that's not necessarily, <laughs> how do I say this? That's not something that I would just like throw up to a client out of left field without being like, hey, can we talk about something? Can I show you a pattern I've noticed? So if you're noticing these patterns in your clients and we do wanna get consent to like have this conversation because this can be really activating in itself. And I do recommend that like, if you're going to actually use these and teach your clients these that you've gone through our foundational certificate program or another program that teaches something similar because you want to make sure that you've got the knowledge and expertise to like teach your clients about this because the worst thing that we can do, or one of the worst things that we can do is be like, Hey, I'm noticing you in this pattern. They're like, okay, what do I do about it? And you're like, I don't know. Or you don't feel adept to like pick out all of the places that they're doing it or really help them see all the places that they're doing it. So I will just give that caveat here. Okay. So last one, last unmet need is survival right? Survival, meaning both psychological and physical survival. Am I going to be shunned from the community? Am I going to, can I trust that other people are going to care about me enough to like make sure I survive both physically and psychologically? So these last two patterns are called rejecting and passive. So the rejecting pattern, the primary focus is on surviving by defending yourself from intimacy and connection. People who have a rejecting pattern view other people as unsafe in general. They view other people as this person does not care about me and does not care if I survive or not. Okay. So people who have a rejecting pattern are essentially saying, you don't care about if I survive or not. So I'm not going to care about if you survive or not. So I'm only going to worry about getting my needs met. And I don't care if I hurt you. I don't care what you need. I don't care if you think I'm being callous or unfeeling or disconnected. It doesn't matter to me because all that matters is me surviving and getting what I need. So the only time that people who have a rejecting pattern are going to, who are in a rejecting pattern are going to show you intimacy or connection is when it serves them. So the rejecting pattern, people who get labeled as narcissistic typically have a strong pattern of this rejecting pattern. And a lot of times it is surrounded with some really good social skills. So it looks like I care about you, but I don't. 
sociopaths are, have a really strong rejecting pattern <laughs> because basically what they're doing is, but, but their rejecting pattern is like, what's layered on top of that is I know how to read a room and I know how to tell what you want. And I know how to tell what it is that you're looking to get from me. So I'm going to make it look like you're getting what you need. And in reality, I don't care if you get what you need. I care what I, I, I care about getting what I need. So the rejecting pattern these people show up as very self-absorbed. Their focus is on how others can inconvenience them, either how others convenience them, make their lives easier, or how others inconvenience them. People who are rejecting are oftentimes guarded. They will show up as angry. They will show up as domineering. They'll be attacking in their interactions with others. Think about the way I think about re um, this rejecting and passive is think about an abused animal. Think about an animal that has been physically abused or neglected and think about approaching that animal. So that animal, if they snarl and show you their teeth and they like start coming at you, that's rejecting pattern. They're saying back up, back up. People who have a rejecting pattern oftentimes have impenetrable, rigid boundaries with others. You cannot get close to me and I will not get close to you. They also see other people's needs as less important than their own. I don't care what you need because I'm too worried about what I need in order to survive. People with a rejecting pattern are disconnected and emotionally distant from others. They are rarely emotionally intimate. And they are also very reactive, especially when inconvenienced or bothered. So this is where the emotional and, and the rejecting patterns can get confused sometimes because rejecting pattern can be very reactive. They can snap, they can snarl, they can get really upset. Back up, remember, back up. You're inconveniencing me, you're bothering me, you're getting in my way, like this is not okay. Versus the emotional pattern, like again, you're inconveniencing, you're bothering me, I don't feel good, I'm not in control, I need to get back in control. Whereas rejecting is like, no, 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 I'm already, I, I feel in control, I don't trust you, you're not safe. And I can't care about you because caring about you is not safe. This is that dog that you can't get close to their cage. Okay. If you have had a rejecting parent, a parent who exhibits this pattern, this is, I mean, all of these patterns are hard. I, I personally feel like the rejecting pattern is one of the hardest patterns to experience as a child, because as a child, we make everything about us. And so we can't understand that our parent never experienced or very rarely experienced safe love and connection and belonging. We can't understand that our parent is showing up as somebody who is very unloved, who felt very unloved and very unsafe. And so they are protecting themselves. We can't, we can't, we can't comprehend that as kids. And so we think it's our fault. We think it's our fault. A lot of times kiddos will develop chronic dysregulation patterns around being pleasing or being passive, which we'll talk about next, because it's a response to this rejecting parent. So parents who exhibit this rejecting pattern often have very little interaction with their kids. They don't show physical affection. They're critical of their kids whenever they need or ask for something. They are, the kiddos of these parents are often stoic. A lot of times they'll seek out other adults who show them love or attention or, or they'll push other adults away because they're like, I'm not, I'm the problem. I'm not safe. So people who have a rejecting pattern are oftentimes really demonized by society. They, we see these people as awful and as horrible and as like people that we're just not gonna, you know, um, we judge them a lot. These are people who oftentimes will end up committing some really like serious crimes where they hurt or harm other people. Because again, you don't care about me. Why should I care about you? And this pattern is developing as a response to not feeling cared about, to not feeling like anyone cares about if they survive or not, if they, okay. So the goal for somebody who exhibits this rejecting pattern is to create safety around emotionally connecting and trusting other people and also to decrease the self-shaming and deprecating behaviors. Because a lot of times people who are feeling this actually have a lot of shame. People who, were, who developed the rejecting pattern oftentimes were rejected themselves. 
And so there's a lot of self-shame. There's a lot of, I'm actually the problem. And so I'm going to develop this. Well, everyone else is the problem and no one else can be trusted as like a compensatory mechanism as a way of dealing with the world, because it's so much easier to believe that other people aren't safe than to believe that I'm not safe. And so that leads us into our last pattern. If we experience the lack of the need of feeling fundamentally safe and secure in our bodies, if we go with that need unmet, we can develop the the world's not safe, or we can develop the pattern of I'm not safe. I can't be trusted. Not other people can't be trusted. Not other people don't care about me. It's I am the problem. So like we just said, a kiddo of a rejecting parent may become rejecting themselves or or develop the pattern themselves, or they may develop the passive pattern. And in this passive pattern, the primary focus is on trying to survive by simply existing and getting by and not inconveniencing others. It's by not causing anyone any more trouble than I already have. So people who present in a passive pattern oftentimes don't trust their own abilities or their own intelligence. They feel like they are a bother or an inconvenience. They may show emotional intimacy, but it'll feel shallow and checked out because they don't trust themselves to connect with you because they feel, they're worried they're just going to hurt you. They're just going to let you down. They're just going to cause a problem. So they're not going to let themselves connect. People who have a passive pattern are unlikely to take responsibility. They prefer when other people lead because, again, they don't think that they are capable of it. And people who have the passive pattern oftentimes have high levels of moral injury. And what this means is, is that they don't show up the way that they, that others have told them they're supposed to, then they let others down. And then there's a lot of shame and burdensome feelings around that. So it becomes a self-perpetuating belief. I'm the problem. I'm the problem. I'm the problem. And so then they become the problem more and more and more and cause more problems for more people. And then it just, it confirms this idea. People who have the passive pattern have very low expectations of themselves and of others. They don't expect others to take care of them or to treat them kindly or to do anything to help them. They don't like expectations where, excuse me, they don't like situations where expectations are placed on them because they don't think they're going to meet them. And they avoid fights and conflicts. They will passively agree with others to avoid arguments. Y'all, this is the abused animal that just like lays down and rolls over. This passive pattern is what I see um, at, at at the very severe level in people who develop failure to thrive. This person has given up and checked out subconsciously. So this is a human that probably when you look at how they show up in like acute threat responses, they freeze because they feel very disempowered, very disempowered chronically. So some examples of passive parents, passive parents will show like shallow interest or care towards their kids, but a lot of the times they'll end up neglecting their kids. They'll have few rules or expectations of their kids. They'll let them do what they want. And people who show up in a passive presentation are oftentimes partnered up with a more domineering parent. So just like the pleasing parent will partner up with a controlling or a rejecting or a superior parent, so will the passive parent. Because the passive parent is, needs somebody there to ensure that things get done because I'm, I'm not going I'm, I'm to do them. Kiddos of parents who present in this passive way are often little adults. They take on a lot more responsibility at home at earlier ages than expected. These are the kids that are like, I made sure the lights didn't get turned off. I made sure the gas didn't get shut off. I made sure that the the bills were paid. I, I got a job at age 12. I went and did things because mom or dad was using substances or was sleeping all day or was not able to care for me in the way that I needed to be cared for. So you can see how people who have a parent who has this passive presentation could develop chronic dysregulation in the way of they could become rejecting because nobody takes care of me. 
they can become controlling because I need to make sure everything's taken care of because no one else is going to do it. I need to be in control because I felt so out of control as a child. So the goals for somebody who has a passive presentation is to take them out of this space of what we also refer to as learned helplessness, to take them, to help them feel more empowered, to decrease their moral injury, to build up their self-esteem, to build up their self-trust again, to create empowering situations for them to connect with other people, to show them that the story that they have been telling themselves their entire life or the story that they have been told their entire life is not true. So for all of these patterns, the goal is to recognize that the story that you have been taught about yourself, the story that you have been taught about how to get your needs met is not true. That you can trust other people to take care of you. You can trust other people to care about you. You can trust other people to care about your safety and security. You can be in control without controlling others. Emotions are okay. Emotions are good. Emotions aren't scary. Your validation doesn't have to come from your productivity. Your worth isn't tied to your productivity. You can see how like a lot of these beliefs we can shift and how as we shift the beliefs around how we get these needs met for control, for safety and security, for love and appreciation. As we shift the limiting beliefs around those, it shifts the chronic dysregulation because we start looking at the world in a different way. So hopefully this has been helpful for those of you who have watched to the end. I want to just take a couple questions on our Facebook live if anybody has them. Um, sounds like this is resonating for a good amount of you. My TikTok people, if you have any questions too, please drop them. I'm so happy to answer them. Um, if you are listening to this on the podcast, you can email us with questions or you can join our Facebook group. Um, the Facebook group is called Becoming Trauma-Informed, Creating Safer and More Shame-Free Spaces. And there's a lot of us in here and it's a great group to be in, I think. You can also like and follow on TikTok if you are watching on there and make sure that you get updated with lives. And if you want to learn this in particular, there's two places to do it. One, we're going to be talking about this some more in the trauma-informed coach. I'm going to be briefly touching on this in that course. If you're listening to this when the course is live, we start Monday, November 1st. It's under $200. There's payment plans available. And I'll drop the link for my Facebook messenger, or excuse me, Facebook messenger, for my Facebook live people, for my TikTok people, it's in the bio, for my podcast people. If you're listening to this before November 1st, you can hop in using the link, our show notes. If you're listening to this after November 1st, we're going to be putting this up as a self-study course in December. So you'll be able to grab it and go through it on your own then. We're also going to be teaching this in depth. This is something that is an entire module that we do in our trauma-informed psychologically safe certificate program, which is our, our foundational program. It is our nine month course where we go super deep, super wide into trauma and how to uh, create safer and more supportive spaces for people. And also just like how to really change your own life from a regulation standpoint. So how to become more regulated, how to step out of these chronic patterns, how to recognize when they're happening, how to recognize when they're happening in other people and how to support other people in them as well. So if you have any desire to learn more about that, we'll have more info on that for you soon. And you can also get a hold of me and let me know if you're interested in that and we'll make sure that you're on the wait list. So deeply enjoyed connecting with all of you today. Hope you have a fabulous rest of your day and we will we'll catch you next time. Thank you so much for listening to today's episode. Invitation to head to our show notes to check out the offers and connections we mentioned, or you can just head straight over to instituteforTrauma.com and hop in our email list so that you never miss any of the cool things that we're doing over at the Institute. Invitation to be well and to take care of yourself this week, and we'll see you next time.